This is Wells Tech, a show that explores the intersection of technology and ministry. Wells Tech is a part of the Streams Media Network, sponsored by Wells, the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. Your show hosts are Martin Spriggs and Sally Draper. Join the conversation at wellstech.wells.net. Hello again, everybody. This is Martin Spriggs with the Wells Tech Podcast. This is episode 359 for Tuesday, September 16th, 2014, show where we talk about technology, ministry, we have news, we have just general conversation about anything that we might find, when I say we, I mean Sally and I, uh, we might find interesting and useful, hopefully, in ministry. Hi, Sally. Hey, Martin. I'm hoping our general conversation goes smoother this week. I tried untying my tongue. I was pretty tongue-tied last week. So that was the kickoff of the new season, and um, we're going to complicate things a little bit more because we're back in the interview thing, which is a good thing. So you don't, uh, you all don't just have to listen to, to Sally and I, or certainly my myself. But uh, we bring in uh, hopefully the best and the brightest from uh, not just from around the synod, but in the case today around uh, Christianity. Somebody who's uh, uh, who's going to talk a little bit of social networks with us today. Yep. So we're focusing on social networks, kind of a a state of the union address, except it's the state of social media and and where exactly the church is in relation to social media. And I guess maybe a good place to start, Martin, is why do we care? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Why Why do do we we care? care? (laughs) Good question. (laughs) There, there is. uh, I think it's it's probably hard to argue against the fact that social networks do play a part in ministry, whether that be you know, at the church level, the school level, the the Christian organization level, the personal ministry level, it seems to be just an extension of our social selves and our social organizations, and that's where conversations happen, right, uh, or can happen. Uh, a lot of back and forth, a lot of uh, off what we would maybe call digital communications versus the, the analog world where you can only be at one place at one time and maybe carry on one conversation at one time. Not true with social networks as they uh, expand your reach and give you the opportunity to talk with people maybe that you've never even met and that's certainly the case with some of our audience uh, on Wells Tech. Absolutely. Um, what a blessing the Wells Tech audience is and a great example of a social network that's that's grown over time. I think um, Building those relationships online might be easier for some people, Martin, and um, not just on the side of the organization that wants to reach out, but on the side of the people that they're reaching out to. Um, Perhaps there are people that might be very hesitant to walk in the doors of your church, but they might be more comfortable expressing themselves digitally, and and, uh, that gives them an outlet and a way to communicate with you by, by being part of that networking. Yep. I've also seen where churches who have done social networking well from an internal communications perspective found that networks can be created that would never have been created otherwise. So people uh, who are of the same feather, so to speak, have the same affinities, can find each other online where if they're in a medium or big size church may not know the other person exists. So you have opportunity to uh, find each other, you have opportunity to share interests, to share uh, maybe faith experiences, but then I think at the end of the day, a primary goal, if not maybe the only goal of social networks, at least as far as the church is concerned, is to take that from a digital relationship to an analog relationship, from a computer screen to computer screen relationship to a face-to-face relationship where um, fellowship can occur, where ministry can occur, where um, caring for the needs of others can occur. I think that's that's probably high on the list of everybody. Yeah, Martin, you hinted at um, basically two different flavors of social networking. Uh, one being in reach and uh, establishing groups within your own organization, your church or your school. Um, perhaps you have some private Facebook groups, for example, for your mom's group or your youth group or whatever it may be. Um, so. Uh, giving a a digital platform to some of those affinity groups and that kind of thing. Um, The other angle, outreach, um, maybe certain social networks are are more prone to 
to use for outreach efforts where you're just trying to spread the good news, reach out to people, make new connections. Or maybe um, you'd want to look into some advertising budget around your social networking, that kind of thing. So um, kind of two different flavors and you want to maybe strategize around the two different groups that you're trying to reach. Yep. I would say, for instance, in reach or internal communications, mm -hmm. The private social network capabilities of some of these tools come to mind. I think certainly of Facebook groups where you can kind of wall that off if you want and restrict membership. Google Plus communities are another one, maybe not as well known, but certainly very full featured in what they can do. Uh, we've talked in the past about things like the Table Project, which are really made for internal communications and intranet on the congregation side. But then, Sally, maybe. As I think of outreach, uh, one of the things that I always come back to for outreach is still going to be that that website hub, that importance of having a good website and a website where you can uh, communicate with the outside world is maybe still job one. Absolutely, Martin. I, I coach people on their church and school websites and I often say let's start at that point and have these channels it's kind of like spokes off the wheel. So the, the website is the hub. And as you communicate via a Facebook post or a Twitter post or whatever it might be, um, drive them back to your website where they can connect further with you on your own home turf kind of thing rather than depending solely on um, the social networking experience. Right, exactly. So uh, maybe we should jump into kind of our state of social media list. We tried to do a little bit of a ranking, a little bit of controversy between the two of us, but that's always healthy, good way <laughs> to start. That's what you like, I think. I like, I like just that. healthy. I, I shoot for that. Um, our rankings, actually, at the top of the list is the same, our number one. Uh, and we're talking about, I think, general usefulness for ministry among all the social networks. I think both you and I would agree that Facebook's still the king. I, I think that's where the people are. And maybe a younger generation might say they're leaving there to find other places. But the people um, that make up our congregations, the parents in our schools, most often you're going to find if they have any account, it's likely a Facebook account. Yep. And, uh, so if you've, got a, if you've got a social strategy, maybe that's a good place to invest some time. Because it does have the benefit of maybe being both an in-reach and outreach tool. I would contend that it's probably a better in-reach tool than outreach, so better internal communications than outreach. But I still think there's usefulness on the outreach side, and there's there's plenty of evidence to suggest that. Maybe worth a mention, Martin, is um, whatever tools you adopt, educate your members on using them and encourage them to share the posts that you're posting on the the church Facebook page, for instance, so that it gets a wider reach and maybe has a dual effect, has that outreach effect as well. Right. Number two, I think we were also in agreement, YouTube is uh, a growing, uh, especially with the advent of a lot of congregations investing in video equipment and putting sermons online or other things online. YouTube, sometimes you don't think as a, of as a social network, but really there's a lot of community around uh, videos and uh, there's a whole commenting system and it's a whole kind of community in and of itself. So YouTube, huge. Yeah, and the, the tools are in our hands these days. I mean, any smartphone basically could be used to, to start a video channel and, and make regular updates. Um, I know uh, one of our listeners that chimed in last week on the podcast, Pastor Fred Kogler, is doing uh, regular video stuff. And I think he's publishing those on Facebook, but you certainly could also post videos if he's not. He certainly could post them on YouTube as well. But um, that that imagery, the video and image um, type communication is very, very popular and well received these days. A strong third in my mind, or maybe even a contender for second or first, was Twitter. And uh, and that's just from personal experience. I, I spend quite a bit of time when I'm looking for news and looking to connect with others and share information on Twitter. Um, and I think there are congregations who make a very effective use of it. You don't think quite as much of Twitter as I do. Yeah, here comes the controversy, folks. Why not? Um, and I guess I... I 
did my time. I was pretty invested in Twitter for quite a while and I've just kind of gotten away from it. I don't see it as really a communication tool that's a big benefit to a congregation. I think um, certainly you could get little bursts of um, you know, devotional material links and things like that out there in your feed, but I, I just see Twitter as having a more of a real-time conversational type um, bent to it, and I, I don't see congregations making use of that as much. Right. I guess I see it as a little bit broader tool than maybe Facebook because Twitter can be a, a very effective tool in the hands of teachers. Mm -hmm. so learning networks, I think you know, you're, if you ask teachers they're, if they're looking to find uh, information uh, about a, a, you know, a different approach or a different uh, subject matter, I think their personal learning networks are where they go, and that's really a, a very strong suit of Twitter. I think you're seeing um, a, a lot of, uh, you know, not just within the church, but within social circles in general, more generally a, a general adoption of Twitter versus Facebook. Uh, and that's maybe because of the short attention spans, because yeah, you've mm -hmm. got uh, you know a few characters just to work with. There's a lot of linking. I think Twitter's also investing in trying to integrate audio and video uh, imagery into uh, you know their tool. So I think that's bringing it a long ways as well. So, so we'll you're looking at it maybe from a different angle than me, Martin. Ministry in general. Yeah, yeah, and more professional development linkages to important articles that are worth um, investing time in, things like that. If you I see Twitter the, for that. If you follow the Wells tweets. Uh, account, you're going to get everything that comes through our website, you know, right in your Twitter feed. So that's, uh, I think that's a big win as well. So the next two, uh, maybe the last two that we have on our top five list, uh, we both, we've talked about and we probably disagree here too. I <laughs> think Instagram is the up and comer, uh, the one that's uh, maybe overlooked, but is is just kind of lying there in the weeds, and it's going to kind of overpower everything eventually, because it's a very image focused approach, and I think that's what uh, appeals to a lot of people is that imagery, and Instagram does a good job with that. And we also want to make mention of Pinterest. We do. And Pinterest has definitely um, got a place in in social networking. And it does. It, it too is imagery based and so um, I could see churches and schools making use of it. I can see it from that professional development angle as well. Many teachers are, are finding great resources out on Pinterest boards so um, I think it does have a place and it needs to be considered as you consider a social media strategy. Yep. A couple of fringe players that we talked about in uh, you know kind of our, our pre-podcast planning LinkedIn, which seems to get traction in certain sectors. I think it's more mm -hmm. professional development area, professional connections or networking uh, tool, and Google Plus, uh, which is the little engine that could maybe and is just trying to, to make the grade, but it doesn't seem to be making a lot of progress. It does, uh, it does resonate with some people. I think photographers really like it. There's a few other groups that really like it, but I don't think that it has a lot of traction within the church. And maybe two other up-and-comers, Tumblr, you hear a lot about. I've never done a lot with Tumblr, but I know people who have and do it effectively. Kind of like a short blog slash video sharing slash image sharing site. Um, and then uh, maybe a tool that people are hearing more and more about, uh, very popular internationally, not as popular here in the States, is kind of a texting tool, WhatsApp, um, a little social network in and of itself on WhatsApp. So, Yeah, just a quick mention on Tumblr. I read an article I think last week that said Tumblr had more um, generated more revenue than Pinterest and it was significantly more. It's the most revenue intensive site so people that want to sell things are finding success on Tumblr which surprised me. That seemed like it was kind of out of the blue. I've heard of it but not I didn't realize there was so much retail built right. into Tumblr. Right. So. Right. so maybe before we leave the topic, Sally, and get to our interview, we should talk about a couple of tools that you may want to look into to, to really leverage social networks. Um, and one of them is uh, Add This. We've talked about that on the show, and we use that on wells.net. Add This is just a little plug-in that allows you to kind of take any piece of content mm -hmm and um, let people share it on different social, the, sh the social network of their choice. 
uh, real easy to embed on your on your blog or your website. You also have the ability on Final Web if you're a Final Web user to use a tool like it. And then the other one would be and uh, it's oh, it also has a WordPress plugin which is what we use. So that's uh, a tool that you probably want to get smarter about and make sure that your website has the ability to share content and uh, be socially friendly, so to speak. Speaking of websites that are easy to share from, you mentioned add this on wells.net, but our Wells mobile platform at m.wells.net has a share button available um, throughout, kind of built into it. So if you're reading the verse of the day or whatever, there's a share link right there built in on the mobile site where you can put that on your Facebook page or tweet about it or whatever. Yep. So. Uh, and then maybe just in general, there are social components built into almost any major platform. We talked about the table project before. Uh, we'll link back to, uh, I think, a conversation we had about the table project. Uversion, a uh, common Bible app, has obviously social sharing built in. Uh, almost any of those sites, uh, Bible Gateway or um, uh, almost any site that has users sign up and log in, that you have an account for is going to have the ability to share something. So, so maybe again building that into your social media strategy. Um, you know, one thing that I like to see is if I adopt a social media platform that I make regular updates. And so um, maybe Tuesday is my day to update um, based on linking back to the U version Bible or whatever. You know, or or following a U version reading plan and doing updating based on that or whatever. I think that those kind of tools can assist you as you build um, your social media content. Yep. Well, Sally, enough about us because, to be honest, neither one of us are real social networking experts. I'm not for sure. Um, at least uh, in the context of ministry, I think we keep our ears open and, and talk to a lot of people who do that. Speaking of talking to a lot of people, we found uh, somebody who was an expert or is an expert, uh, Lauren Hunter from Church Tech Today. I ran across this website, Sally, oh, maybe a year or so ago when I was looking at sourcing material for a couple presentations I was going to do on social networking. And um, I ran across uh, Lauren's work and this website called uh, Church Tech Today, and found a couple great ebooks on uh, social networks and the and the church, how a church can leverage social networks. So she was good enough to uh, agree to come on the show for us, and we did a little bit of an interview. So let me see if I can cue that up now, and uh, let's listen to our conversation with Lauren. We are very pleased this morning to have Lauren Hunter, founder and chief blogger of churchtechtoday.com, uh, joining us. Hi, Lauren. Hi. Thank you How so you much for, for joining us. Uh, we've never met, um, so this is a first for us, and uh, really happy to uh, agree to join us for, for our little podcast. Uh, I kind of found your work uh, while I was doing some prep for a conference I was giving out in the L.A. area on social media and the church and ran across some some cool stuff from I, I wasn't familiar with your site or the ebooks that you would produce and we'll jump into that in a minute but was really excited to to have you come on and talk a little bit about some uh, tech and ministry kinds of things tell us a little bit about yourself your background and uh, how you got into this ministry stuff and, and maybe a little bit of background on the the site itself church tech today if you if you wouldn't mind Sure, I'd be happy, Martin. Um, I have been in technology, public relations, and marketing since the late 90s in Silicon Valley and ended up going off to a company called Christianity.com, which has changed hands and changed focus over the years. But at that point, I was the PR manager for Christianity.com and was doing public relations for um, you know, technology in the ministry market. And so that was a really cool shift for me. Um, I sort of radically changed the focus of the work that I was doing. And so I ended up moving out of town and starting a consulting business, um, working with technology providers, helping them reach out and share what they were doing um, through all the different publications in the ministry market. And so when web and digital started taking over, um, magazines started dropping off like flies, and I saw a real need for a website that focused solely on church technology. Um, for number one, many of the customers 
working with had no place to really funnel their news and announcements and good things that they were doing for the church. Um, and the church didn't really have a place to go just for technology information and, you know, not a whole lot of other stuff. Okay. So that was the kind of the beginning and you decided uh, a website was kind of the best way to get that information out? Right, exactly. So I began that in 2007. We just uh, celebrated seven years of, uh, of life. <laughs> the same age as my, my third child. I have four kids, and, and the third one matches up to Church Tech today. So. <laughs> okay, cool. Makes it easy to keep up with. And um, you mentioned that you're the, the lead blogger, so you have others that, that blog there on the, the website as well? Right, right. It's it's my company, my site, but I do. Um, and actually, the ebooks that uh, Martin had mentioned, I co-authored together with Jeremy Smith, who runs um, his own site, 78p.tv. And so we partnered. He was um, editor for my site for a little while. Um, oh, thank you so much for putting that up there. Yeah. Um, and so this is a collaboration of all of the ebooks. There's there's eight ebooks total, um, seven on the different social media networks, and then the the eighth one, which was actually the first book. You can see it in green there. Social media and the church um, kind of has a, a lot of that content put together. Um, so you can go on there and click those hyperlinks and download each book individually if you would like to do that, or I'm also going to put a bundle up. I'm going to bundle all the ebooks together and I'll have that link up pretty quick um, so that if, if uh, churches or educators want to download all of those books kind of as one to save some headache, they can do that. Right. And it's great that you've made them available for free, and that's an, that's a, that's an awesome thing. What I really liked about the books, and I've used them uh, a number of times now and, ref uh, and referred people to them, is kind of their simplicity. It's sometimes um, overwhelming to look at all these things, and, and you really kind of nail it down to just a few, you know, six things. You know that uh, that a church or a, an organization can can focus on. Um, What's the process of, of kind of writing material for that? Did you did you do some interviews? Is, was it just from previous ex ministry experience? How did you get to the point of actually yeah. putting the material in the book? Good, good questions. Um, Jeremy actually, he he was the main editor on those books, and then I consulted with him. But he has a youth ministry background and was with Youth for Christ, and then he actually was the social media coordinator for Youth for Christ, like all of Youth for Christ. Um, and so <clears throat> he had a real handle on kind of the youth ministry take of it, and also um, he has a real unique ability to kind of boil it down and simplify for churches. So, I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure you probably realize, too, that many pastors, I mean, it's just overwhelming how much information there is and how many different articles. If you Google one network, you come up with scores and scores and scores of articles, and where do you start? Where do you begin? So this is a good starting place and a good, you know, especially for somebody who's not super technical um, and doesn't have hours and hours and hours to do training on a network. It sort of boils it down and gives it to them in nugget form. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's really good for somebody just starting out especially. Um, what kind of feedback have you been getting from the ebooks or just the general content yeah. from the website? Um, really good. We, we have a content partnership with churchleaders.com, and so they've done a giveaway of each of the ebooks. Um, I think they've rotated. They have uh, several newsletters, uh, ones for leaders, ones for kids, ones for you know youth ministry, um, worship, and technology ministry. So they've, they've given those away, and I mean, there's been thousands of downloads of the, of the ebooks. So there's, there's no lack of desire uh, of information. Right. I just have to jump in and say I was really excited to see that there was one on Pinterest. I know, Martin, you were probably most excited about that. Martin's yeah. favorite social network. <laughs> really, Martin, what's, what's your favorite uh, favorite board? Yeah. Board? Oh. Yeah, like he knows uh, about boards. <laughs> anyway. With Pinterest. I know Sally's our Pinterest queen. So, um, and, and that's interesting, too, because there are a lot of options for uh you know, people interested in using social networks for ministry, and there's uh, maybe different opportunities depending on who your target market is, and uh, there's uh, just many ways to, to kind of approach that segment of ministry, and uh, I think you did a good job in kind of selecting the, the big heavy hitters and maybe some areas that uh, congregations hadn't even thought about using. Uh, I think some of the newer areas like Instagram are, are gaining some traction big time in, in some of our churches at this point. 
Yeah, very true. Um, Lauren, I have a kind of a broader question for you, like um, looking to the future, maybe you have a crystal ball there or something, but what do you see as the big thing that's happening in the next few years in terms of technology and the church? Yeah, great question, Sally. Um, I'm often kind of looking for ways to, to cast a vision for what uh, churches should be looking towards. And I would say there's, there's a couple of things. Um, number one, mobile giving is huge. I mean, mobile anything is huge. But mobile giving, um, and I actually woke up to NPR this morning when they were talking about Apple's wallet. Um, mm -hmm. Is that what they're calling it? No, I forgot. Apple Pay, uh, yeah. Apple Pay, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so they were talking about just waving your cell phone over the register and it taking, you know, the money, a, take, a token and all this good stuff. And I'm thinking, huh, I wonder how the church market's going to adapt those things. Um, we do have several uh, sponsors on Church Tech Today that do mobile giving. Um, and, and I don't think, uh, you know, the church market technically lags behind just, just a smidge <laughs> with, yeah. with, they're not, not in the early adopter question. category, <laughs> but still, you know, if a church is invested in one of those ATM kiosks where, uh, giving kiosks where they can, uh, you know, put in their card or type in their information, I'm just, I'm curious how the church is going to respond to, you know, mobile giving in that way. Um, text to give is huge, you know. Um, I, I wrote a success story on a church recently that had done a text to give campaign, and so the, the image um, that's embedded in the article had a picture of a slide up on their big screen with, you know, to give, text to, you know, SMS, you know, 25464. Um, and basically you pull out your phone and you can type in the number, like a text message and the amount and give um, right like that. And so that that's kind of revolutionary because for so many people that don't carry cash and don't, um, don't uh, have the opportunity to bring a checkbook uh, or even know what a checkbook is. I think there's, you know, under 30, maybe they don't even have a checkbook. Yeah. So being able to do that, those kinds of things from a device is alluring. Yeah. We talked, we had a little e-giving segment uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, one of the live viewers made the comment that the, you know, most of my members, the only time they write a check is for <laughs> on Sunday morning. Right. Uh, right. Uh, and I think you, know, you, you mentioned church is sometimes a little bit behind the curve. And, but I think they'll, they'll get there. They'll recognize that they need to be relevant and, and meet the people where they're at. Um, speaking of relevance, I think your, your, your blog or your, your website, Church Tech Today, does a great job at that. How often do you update the content and how do you decide what to write and what to include yeah. on the site? That's a good question. Um, I update the site Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, so I've pretty much been on that uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday schedule. Yeah, your lights are going out over there, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been on that schedule for years and years and years. It's helpful for me just to plan on those days, so I usually do a, two heavier articles and then maybe um, a free giveaway or um, an infographic. A lot of Fridays I'll do an infographic because it's a lighter day and people are interested in something quick that they can, you know, look through and gather information you know, do those on all different kinds of things like you know Christian universities or education or online giving or you know any kind of different topic that's tech related. Very good. So if you were to be asked to help a pastor get started in the realm of technology, maybe yeah. using technology better than what they have in the past or whatever it is, where, where do you start Lauren? What kind of advice would you give um, someone who wants to beef up their technology efforts? Yeah, first of all, um, and I, I get these emails often, so and it's always encouraging to me because I'm like, yay, pastors pastors are reading it. <laughs> and they're asking the questions. I think half the battle is just asking the questions. Um, but doing an audit is a great place to start, and audit maybe is maybe kind of a scary word uh, for some, but in the communication and in the consulting you know, world, that's kind of the first place to figure out what you're doing. Um, so take a look first, you know, how is my website performing if I'm a pastor? How is, are people engaging with my website? Um, are people um, using it to log in to do their online giving? Are people, you know, take a look at all the different things that you're offering so far, or how you're utilizing what the touch points are of technology first. Um, and then, you know, the research phase is next. And then deciding, you know, budget, 
what you have available to um, to use to implement new technology, and then what technologies are going to be best for your congregation and meet their needs. Obviously, a congregation may be in a small town that doesn't do a lot of internet and doesn't even have. I mean, some churches still don't don't even have a website. So taking a look at those those things, and you know, I mean, if you don't even have a website and your congregation isn't very tech savvy, um, having an Instagram page is probably not super helpful. <laughs> you want to just do lots of things for the sake of technology. You know, if nobody knows what Pinterest is, you're not going to want to waste your time there. Right. Um, but but having a website and having online giving, that might be a good place to start. Um, church software, um, it's called management software or accounting software, that might be a good place to start to evaluate what you're already using, um, to see if it's meeting your needs. Um, to pull reports and see how people are engaging, you know, through giving and engaging through registering, registering for events or classes. That's a good place to start. Yeah. One one thing that strikes me when we kind of thought through this question is, I see a lot of pastors really get excited about technology, and sometimes it it ultimately consumes them, and then they spend more time on the technology than ministry. Right. I'm assuming that part of you know maybe the consulting process is you're encouraging them to find the the right people around them in their congregation or wherever that can can really take a hold of some of this stuff and drive it as opposed to just out of the pastor's office. Is that uh, is that kind of accurate in the way you approach things too? Definitely. Um, you know, there's all different kinds of people, all different kinds of pastors, and so definitely some, I mean, you can kind of tell as you look sometimes at the bios of pastors and the age bracket of some pastors and the website, you can tell that there's more of a flair and an interest for being techno technologically engaged. Um, and then you can kind of tell, you know, the opposite. Um, right. But definitely getting getting someone um, alongside you if you're in ministry so that you can still focus. I mean, I my personal philosophy is that technology is a complement to the face-to-face, real-time relationships that ministry demands. So if you're substituting, you know, a Hangout, a Google Hangout like we're doing now, or if you're substituting, substituting, um, you know, text messages for a real sit down over coffee to hash through big life issues that someone's going through, like, that's a red flag. So it, it's meant to be a compliment. So, you know, the first is always face to face, one on one, you know, in a small group, if you can meet in person, if you can have coffee with a friend, if you can meet for counseling, like that's still primary right. in my mind. And the secondary are, you know, how do you support relationships and community through technology? technology. Cool. Lauren, that's about all the time we have. Really appreciate you taking the time to talk a little bit sure. about uh, what your work and uh, really excited to follow that. So in general, I think the uh, the encouragement would be just to uh, make sure you're checking out check, uh, churchtechtoday.com is kind of the place they should be going, right? Or are there other resources that they can uh, find your stuff on the web? Um, that that's the main resource for church technology. Um, I do have a few other sites that aren't related to technology, but um, right. there's you know Google Google church technology too. I mean, my site pops up number one, but there are a handful of other great sites as well. Church Mag is one of them. Church um, C H U R C H M dot A G. Um, yep. There are so many, many helpful. Churchleaders.com is great. Um, Lifeway.com is great. They have a new tech channel. There's a lot of, of really great resources out there. Yeah. Be curious. So look out there. See what uh, see what people are doing. And uh, really appreciate what you are doing. Thanks for the uh, the free eBooks. I'll continue to use those and continue to encourage uh, people to use those as well. So thanks, thank Sally. you so much, Laura. Appreciate it. Yeah. Blessings. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Martin. It was a pleasure to be here. All right. Thanks to Lauren. That was uh, good of her to spend uh, 15 minutes of her time with us. And uh, you can tell she lives and breathes this. I really respect people who can pump out that amount of content. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, as she mentioned, and you know, creating infographics and just kind of constantly thinking about technology and ministry. We kind of do it part time. We have. Yeah, I would almost view what we do, Sally, as a hobby. She does. She lives and breathes it, and uh, that's got to be rewarding too, I think. Yeah, and you can see the the fruits of her labor. She has a great website and a lot of great content. Just like um, we're constantly saying, you know, it's great to have that archive built where we can reference, and and she does as well. So good work. Very good. Um, 
So that's churchtechtoday.com if you want to, to follow her work. And again, Lauren, thanks for for taking the time to uh, to share with us what you do, what you're doing there. News and tech is our next segment. Sally, a lot of news. It's been a newsy week, Martin, um, and it started with um, some mail that I received because I subscribed to Time Magazine, one of those uh, freebie magazines that you get because of your airline points. So I got my Time Magazine this week. Maybe I'll share my screen because it's easier to see on the computer than on my actual magazine. But I was really intrigued by the cover of Time this week. It says, Never Offline. The Apple Watch is just the start. How wearable tech will change your life like it or not. And uh, kind of interesting, and it, it actually made me think about uh, Hidden Power of Electronic Culture, the book by Shane Hips that we read a few years back on the podcast, because um, the point of it is that um, you can keep up with your heart rate and your calorie intake and your exercise levels and things even easier now by wearing the Apple Watch and many other similar devices. Um, but all of that is with some caution because you're kind of letting technology get really close, kind of inside your personal space by doing that kind of thing. Um, one paragraph that uh, I thought worth sharing, it says, the more of our behavior that ends up online, the more the internet affects that behavior and wearables will reach deep into our lives. That's tremendously empowering, but it also makes us vulnerable to the rampant comparison and gamification that infect any aspect of our lives that become public. Just for example, the idea of another body conscious young woman comparing physical data constantly in real time is worrying. So sometimes we need to go off stage and I'm not sure the Apple Watch is going to let us do that. I just thought it was an interesting perspective. We we talked about this announcement last week, but time had something to say about it. So. Yeah, the whole Internet of Things will be really interesting to see how that progresses. Uh, you can jump on a scale and have it immediately tweet out to the world you know, how you're doing. <laughs> I mean, there's all kinds of things meant to motivate and improve life, but I'm sure as the article suggests that you know, there's a dark side to every light side, so it's, uh, it's something that uh, maybe we ought to proceed with caution. Yeah. So there was some other news that probably was uh, resonating in the Draper household in particular, and that's a little game called Minecraft was being bought by Microsoft for a lot of money. Just a small price tag there, $2.5 billion that Mojang with a B, sold. Yes. Um, sold Minecraft for. So, um, yeah, I got scooped on this one, Martin. I sat down to dinner last night, and my uh, son, Luke, who's a junior in high school, said, wow, did you hear about the Microsoft deal? And I'm like, wait a minute. You know news and tech, and I don't. So um, I guess if it involves Minecraft, uh, he's got the, the lead on that. So. so what do you think that means? Does that mean anything that Microsoft's buying that? Well, um, I guess the verdict is still out. I think Microsoft wants to appeal to a younger crowd, and they see this as a, an end for that. And they also um, see platform-wise that Xbox, this is very popular. Right? Um, yeah, definitely for their Xbox platform, but it's already got an iOS and Android following. And so I think um, maybe they got into a little bit of market that they hadn't really had a foothold in there. So, so they're buying, buying eyeballs, buying uh, passionate users. So For sure. That all works out. Yeah. There was, okay. There's some affection there for those Minecraft creators. The, the lead guy's screen name is Notch, and Luke said he could understand Notch wanting to get out of the business. So he was commiserating with Notch over, I think Notch himself made 1.8 billion of that 2.5. So yeah, poor Notch. <laughs> He's out of there. Don't commiserate so, him with him with yeah. too much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Let's move on to ministry resources. And we do have one to share here. This is an article that came across my desk um, from Christian Copyright Solutions website. We've talked about this site Great before website. on the podcast. Yep. And they have a, a lot of um, really useful educational information in the field of copyright, which is a difficult area for any congregation to uh, address. This article was interesting to me because I didn't even realize this existed. But there is something in copyright law called religious service exemption. Were you aware of that, Martin? Religious yes, service uh, exemption. Don't ask me to go <laughs> on the depths of what it, how that all translates into what a congregation can and can't do. But yeah, this is a good article. It references it. 
Right, and you you don't have to go into the depths because they do, They've and they explain it, it very you. well. And you know, it's a great thing. Apparently, if you're um, performing in a religious setting, you know, certain things are free from copyright restrictions. However, that doesn't cover you very far, and that's what the point of the article is. Yes, it's okay for that particular setting, but you can't broadcast it. You can't. Um, distribute any um, copies of it or anything like that and so you know these guys at Christian Copyright Solutions they they think through this and they share the the ramifications of this particular exemption in this article so a good read um, everybody wants to stay up to date on copyright stuff it's just really exciting but it, it, seriously well, you should. I mean it's good stewardship <laughs> and you, you want to, to abide by the law so. absolutely so there's no excuse for, for not because there's great articles and great companies out there like this uh, providing that detail. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to our tips and picks section. Ladies first, Sally. I'm going to keep right on talking, Martin, and I'm really excited about this because our friends over at Code.org have a new section of their website. Code.org is a fairly new site, been up for about a year, and the idea of it is to promote uh, students learning to code. And this new section, studio.code.org, has got coding uh, lessons for kindergarten and up. Holy cow. So you don't even have to be able to read to use their site. And um, I had a really good time just playing around yesterday because you can see here on the site there's a button for student sign up and teacher sign up. I went through the teacher sign up process. And I created a site um, geared toward those early elementary students. And when you create it as a teacher, you get a list of um, passwords. Except for these non-readers, they're going to have trouble typing in a password, so they give them a past picture. So student three, their picture looks like a little green Martian guy. So if I come to the site, all i got to be able to find is my student three link, and then I have to pick the correct picture. And there's my green uh, Martian guy, if I click on him and click sign in, then I am logged into the site, except somehow it didn't work for me. Maybe because I'm logged in. I, I'm logged in as a teacher. That's why. I thought I logged out. I'm sorry. Let me try this one more time because I <laughs> thought it was it if Sally can super <laughs> cool. Um, and I lost my link. Okay. Um, so We get the picture. I'm going to go here. I made a brand new page on the Wells Tech Wiki. There's my green Martian guy. Where'd he go? Here he is. Click sign in, and I'm in. There you go. All right. So um, you can progress through the lessons. As a teacher, you'll see how the students progress. So the first thing they want to do is teach you just some drag and drop techniques. So these students just drag and drop, and they succeed and keep going to the next puzzles. Um, you can, you know, jump back to the list of things to do. Um, and by now, as they've progressed, they're teaching you how to, to build a little program. Teaching, you know, making the person walk a particular direction, whatever it is. And apparently, I didn't do it skills, right. Building logic <laughs> skills is uh, exactly early stages, and that's really fundamental in, in programming. You have to understand mm -hmm. flow ifs and thens and logic and, and workflows um, at, and they've made it very visually appealing. Mm -hmm. And they have some loops and things that they mm -hmm. teach them. It's all there. So um, what I want to say is that that Wells Tech Wiki, it probably needs to be refreshed, Martin, because I didn't find a page for this out on the Wells Tech Wiki, so I had to create one. So I made a brand new page about teaching students to program in the school classroom technology section and I have links to various articles as well as code um, dot org studio with my samples. You can log in as an elementary or mid-elementary student and see how it works. Try it out. Um, there are other sites as well. Everything from Scratch to Khan Academy to Code Academy and Code Combat and many others. So if you're looking for resources for teaching students to program, uh, we've got the page for you. It's all set up on the Wells Tech Wiki. And that is my pick of the week. Nice pick. Um, my pick of the week, Sally, is, uh, let me just uh, load up my screen here, is a little gadget that I have uh, procured back in the spring called the Belkin 
hands-free Bluetooth car kit. And what it does is it allows a not-so-recent car who doesn't have maybe Bluetooth built into the stereo to have Bluetooth so that you can connect your smart devices, specifically your phone or your iPod, something that has Bluetooth so that you can play podcasts or music or other things through it, or just in general practice hands-free uh, operation of your vehicle because you can uh, also operate your phone in many cases through this little device. You really want to operate your vehicle hands-free? <laughs> I think operate that's what you said. Operate your phone hands-free. <laughs> okay, better. I do operate hands-free. A little knee driving, have you ever done that? Oh, no, don't tell me. <laughs> anyway, um, thanks for the catch. Yeah, I don't want to spread any uh, inappropriate... <laughs> Look, Mom, no hands. <laughs> ...driving your car. Although I did dri ride my bike many, many times hands-free. So. That's okay. Is it? Okay. <laughs> anyway, this is uh, Belkin Hands-Free Bluetooth, uh, which allows older cars, like I mentioned, to to uh, able to connect up to your phone for hands-free uh, operation of your smartphone or uh, uses, uh, you know, telephone or, you know, the, the media player you know, on the phone that allows you to, to do that. Uh, it just plugs into your auxiliary uh, in, uh, input, so you need an aux in. And as you can see, it's really just a, uh, a little device that uh, affixes to your dash. It has a pass-through USB plug-in, so you plug that into your lighter. You can plug uh, other USB things into it. Uh, it uh, it's not the prettiest thing, but it's very, very functional. Um, and it has a little light on it that'll tell you when it's connected to a Bluetooth device. It's really easy to pair. And it's not that expensive. It's only like 60 bucks. You can get it on Amazon or Walmart or Best Buy, those kinds of places. And it allows uh, you to uh, kind of save the money if you were thinking about maybe upgrading your stereo to support Bluetooth. This is a good way to avoid that expense and uh, you can install it yourself. So that is my pick of the week. Really like it. Use it every day. Got a question for you. We do something similar but we do a wired version and it goes to our radio stations. So you pick a radio station that's dead. It doesn't have anything yep, on FM it. transmitter. Kind yeah. Of thing. And that's not always the greatest quality. Is this a better quality? Yeah, because it's going straight over a wire. Yep. Okay. I mean, it's, it's as good as regular Bluetooth. Awesome. Um, so it's taking that Bluetooth signal, transferring it to the aux jack, and then plugging, you know, pumping that in. So, and the microphone works pretty well. So you want to put it on your dashboard in a place where it can hear you, so it uh, becomes the microphone for your phone, and uh, you know, voice operation of the phone is possible through that. So had plenty of phone conversations over it, and for sixty bucks, works pretty well. Sweet. All right. We have some insider information. Old insider segment, yes. That's right. I should probably share my screen. Um, focusing on a new certificate program through the Commission on Evangelism, you can actually become certified in evangelism. That's a great thing to be certified in, sharing the good news. Um, this fall, they're kicking off a new course led by Pastor Mike Hentz, who happens to be the administrator for the Commission on Evangelism. It's called Practical Evangelism for Congregations. And they're running it through the MLC Continuing Ed um, area. So you basically become an MLC student to pursue this certification. So if you're interested, check out our show notes. We'll have a link to the course. And from there, you can get registered through the MLC website. Very good. A couple of need-to-knows. Uh, one of them is, uh, we mentioned it briefly last week, is we are looking for people who are willing to donate old phones, specifically the iPhone 4. It has to be that model and actually has to be on the AT&T or T-Mobile networks. You may have it tucked in a drawer or uh, maybe you're looking at upgrading to the new phone, whatever. If you have an iPhone 4 and would like to donate it, the Malawi Mission Field Pastor Paul Nitz or missionary Paul Nitz is looking for people to donate these so that they can be given to national pastors and increase the communication amongst themselves and with Pastor or missionary Nitz 
in the field. He says it's really uh, it would be a win for them to have these devices because uh, uh, computers just aren't used as much, or uh, the, the the ability to use a mobile device could be a real uh, help to them in communicating with each other. And he sent us a little bit of a clip to explain a little bit more about what uh, how that might benefit. So let me see if I can play this for you. Have e only a few of our pastors have email, those living in the cities, but all of our pastors could have email capability if they had a smartphone. Martin helped me test out used iPhones here in Malawi and it worked great. I can't tell you how much this would improve communication between pastors if they all had these iPhones. Thanks for sharing that, Paul. Uh, so there Only is a few of our pastors <laughs> have email. He'll share it again stop. if you want. Yeah, he'll keep sharing it unless <laughs> I stop him. Um, but uh, th there's definitely a need for this, and it's something. It's an it's an older technology for us in the states, but would would be hugely beneficial uh, to the national pastors out in Malawi. So uh, the way to do that, and we'll put a link in the show notes to uh, a web page for more information. Uh, but is to to really just send it here to the Center for Mission and Ministry. Uh, at, and to the attention of the technology office. We'll be collecting these and uh, we're looking for 30 or so phones to send in. So not an insignificant number. So check your uh, junk drawer or whatever. If you have an iPhone 4 that you're not using or are willing to donate, there'll be some instructions on the website too how to package it up and how to, to clear off your stuff and then send it on over and then we'll get we'll collect them and send them out to Africa. Exciting ministry opportunity. It is. Love to help our missionaries. Um, we also have an opportunity for our, our pastor listeners to participate in a Wells Tech survey. Uh, you can find the survey online at bit.ly slash pastors tech survey. And for those that take the time to fill it out, tell us a little bit about the tech that you use. Um, to carry out your pastoral duties, uh, you could win a copy of Hemsoft Player 3.0, courtesy of our friends at That's Northwestern right Publishing. Here. Lovely. Uh, be right here in the shrink wrap box, Hemsoft 3.0, a Lutheran hymnal, occasional services, supplement, uh, both works for Mac and PC. So, right here for Love you. Love to have a copy of that. That's so, a how do they enter? They go to bit.ly slash pastors tech survey and maybe five minutes of your time, uh, but it's going to help us build some shows in the future where we talk about uh, different technology. And already, Martin, I'm, I'm kind of perusing the submissions and learning new things, so it's neat to, to find out what people are using out there. Very good. So mm -hmm. you pastors perk up. Uh, even if you can't uh, use the software, I'm sure you have somebody who, who may want to take advantage of it neighboring right. congregation, whatever. One more link to share. It's wells.net slash wellstechconf. We're excited to be offering a Wells Tech Conference next summer. It's July 9th through 11th at the Country Springs Hotel and Conference Center. And currently we're looking for presenters. So if you have some tech skills that would be a benefit to those who attend, it could be anything from distance education to security to productivity tools to music technology and all in between, whatever your forte is, we'd like to hear about it. We'd like to consider you um, as a breakout uh, session presenter and we have a short survey for you to fill out to tell us about your ideas. So please do that. Our time is running out. It's already September 16th. Our deadline is September 30th. So head on over. It's wells.net slash wellstechconf to get signed up as a presenter. Very good. Looking forward to that conference a lot. Um, let's move on to our community feedback section. Sure, and uh, we want to just kind of share a couple of emails that people sent in this week. The first one is from Judy Trunkel, who's at uh, St. John's in Nielsville, um, Wisconsin, I assume. Yep, that's and, way up north. Okay. Um, and their congregation is looking into um, the potential of adding closed captioning. So they do uh, record their services, put them on DVDs, deliver those DVDs to shut in members, um, but they have a member who is deaf. Um, and so they wanted to be able to add closed captioning. And you know, um, 
it's been a while since we've talked about closed captioning on the podcast, Martin. I know that um, there are a few websites, YouTube being one, that will attempt to listen to your videos you upload and translate them and, and provide closed captioning. Um, probably the industry leader there is a website called .sub.com, and um, they will not only provide closed captioning, but they'll help you translate it into multiple languages. And so I definitely sent Judy links to, to YouTube and .sub.com. There's one congregation, Zion in Torrance, California, that's regularly doing um, closed captioning. And, and um, we will have a link in, a show, in the show notes to their closed caption channel, um, which is on .sub.com. Um, and then beyond that, I don't have a lot of expertise. I know that closed captioning typically is in a separate file that kind of marries with the video and to actually put that onto a DVD might be a little more complex than actually doing the web versions where um, the closed captioning is kind of built into the software. Kind of built in. Yeah, it's right. gotten really easy to do. Mm -hmm. so, so that might be a better way to go is to try to get it online with the captioning rather than um, investing time and energy and learning curve and software potentially to do the, the DVD version. I'm wondering if, if you do it online and then you download a YouTube video whether it comes along for the ride or not. You know, I'm just based on my limited knowledge, I'm guessing potentially not because I remember the fact that you have to have this separate file that there's a there's a structure to how that captioning works. But that's just me guessing because I haven't really looked into it in a long time. Yep. Okay. Good. Thank you for the for the uh, message, Judy. Appreciate the question. Another email that we received was from Pastor Ben Berger, who's at St. Paul's in Winnicon, Wisconsin. Winniconny. Winniconny. Excellent. I'm glad you're here for pronunciation, Martin. That's well, good I, to hear. I enjoy this part of the segment, uh, this, this <laughs> segment of the show, just for this reason. Yeah, whatever. All right. He's having a hard time finding what he's looking for on our Wells Tech site. He was wondering about video editing software. He'd like to do more with video again um, and this time I was able to offer him a few suggestions particularly Adobe Premiere which is what you use Martin to yeah. edit the Wells Tech the podcast. Right. Um, I'm a Camtasia Studio fan which has kind of got a different flavor to it um, but is also very capable as a video editor as well and if you go the route of either route you want to make sure you look into nonprofit pricing because um, oftentimes vendors like those two um, have special deals for nonprofits. I guess one other major player is Pinnacle and their Pinnacle Studio software that might be a direction to go as well. And there's online tools, uh, you know, as well as Movie Maker and iMovie, that kind of stuff, and and just some basic editing tools in things like YouTube. So if you've mm -hmm. got videos up there, you can do some editing and trimming and cutting and you know transitions, those kinds of things. That's true. Martin, you have a link that you wanted to share with us. I do. I ran across this just a few hours before the show and tweeted it out and wanted to share it with the class of the create. Speaking of Adobe. Uh, and their creative cloud, they have a deal going. I don't know if how long this is going to be available for. It sounds pretty permanent. They call it Creative Cloud Photography, where they're bundling Photoshop and Lightroom. Photoshop is uh, probably the the uh, tool for uh, image editing. Uh, very expensive package normally. And Lightroom, which is a photo, uh, both, it will edit photos, but it's for photo management. I use it for, for all of my photography. And you can do some pretty sophisticated uh, uh, editing there as well, uh, retouching, uh, red eye removal, uh, you know, lots of other things. Um, but they're bundling them together for a Creative Cloud license for $9.99 a month. Wow. Uh, which sounds like a good deal to me. So 10 bucks, 120 bucks a year, you would have access to Photoshop and Lightroom. So anybody who's uh, into photography, this is a big win. Uh, or even if you just uh, do some image editing for your website, this may not be a bad thing to check out as well. Uh, I don't know if that is a... Uh, I didn't click on the link, so I'm not sure if you have to... Actually, that's for an annual, pa annual plan. Uh, if you go month to month, uh, oh no, the annual plan is 119 a year. Uh, I think the math works out to about the same. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? <laughs> so Imagine that. 999 a month or 
119, <laughs> 80, 80 years. So they do the math there for you, but big no, cut a there. special deal. <laughs> uh, but it's I think it's still a uh, a big a, a good uh, a good price for uh, what you're getting there. So yeah, you really can't pick either what? one of those uh, things. So. Normally, Photoshop six hundred dollar product. Am I stand alone? Yeah, I don't know if they even sell it that way anymore. Maybe they do, but uh, usually it's through this Creative Cloud cloud subscription process. But uh, for the whole suite, I think a student or educator license is like thirty bucks a month. But then you get Premiere, you know, like we just talked about for video editing, and Adobe Illustrator and InDesign. A lot of things maybe that you wouldn't use here. They're just slimming it down and uh, making these available for ten bucks a month. So, awesome, good find. All right, a couple more things that we want to share from our community feedback segment. Um, uh, Email recently from Joshua Johnson out at Nebraska Lutheran High School, um, trying to stream um, with an unmanned camera. So he's looking for feedback on anybody that's doing that kind of thing. Uh, they have a lot of sports, and maybe they take the time to man their varsity games, but those junior varsity parents would like to see some of those games as well. So he's looking for a solution for just a mounted camera that they could turn on and and run without someone actually manning the camera. So if anyone has experience in that area, um, let Joshua know because he'd love to hear about it. One thing, Joshua, well, one thing that we use, we don't man our cameras for any of our streaming. Um, so the, and the cameras we use maybe are, you know, maybe there's a budgetary constraint for, for you guys, but uh, I think the cameras that, uh, I think you can get a camera that can be remotely operated for under 700 bucks, 600 bucks. Uh, pan tilt zoom kind of camera. Then you need a controller, which would hook up via what's called a Visca cable or R232, I believe, is the number. So that's probably the the tools that you're looking for that would allow you to do that. A little Star Wars reference there. R2. Two, no, no okay. I, this probably predated Star wow. Wars. Wow. If you believe that, but. Uh, Martin, this Android app compatibility comes to Chrome OS. I think that That's might have been an article you yep. tagged as well. I probably did um, now that I'm thinking about it because I thought, hey, this is cool. I don't even have it up on my screen. But uh, this, what, what this allows a uh, Chromebook to do, which is kind of constrained, you don't have... Uh, you know all the uh, you know the conveniences of a full-blown computer, but this would allow you to use some apps that don't have maybe web versions or as good a web versions as they do app versions. So one of the ones that they talk about here is Evernote. The Evernote app for Android is really good. Uh, the web version not as good. So here is a here is the capability now of taking an Android app and bringing it into the browser, bringing it into Chrome OS, so that you kind of have now an app store beyond just the Chrome OS app store, which are really just web apps. Now you have full-blown uh, app apps, so to speak. Uh, so I think there's a lot of potential here. And this is a, a nice win for developers, too, where they can develop you know, an, an app that runs on Android, but also could be used on Chrome. So I think there's lots of educational application here. So it opens up a whole new world of different uh, capabilities. Plus, you feel like your investment in an app is multifunctional now. Exactly. So I'm not yeah. just buying it for my, my mobile device, but I'm cross-platform. Yeah, I wonder how that will work if there is a, uh, a cost to it in the Play Store and how that actually works on the uh, on the Chrome uh, you know, Chrome OS platform. So this isn't like across the board yet. They're just trying it with a few apps at this point, and so we'll see how it develops. Cool. Uh, yep. Very cool. One more link that I tagged is from the Educational Technology and Mobile Learning blog, and it's a link to 11 great YouTube channels for teachers. So cool. start of school year, uh, may want to per peruse these channels and see what kind of things you can find here. There's one um, called ASAP Science. Here's one called SciShow. Um, just a variety here. This was shared by uh, my good friend Dr. Jim Grunwall here at Martin Luther College. So thanks, Jim, for the link. Nice. That's what we got for community feedback, Martin. Okay, next week, an alert here, a little announcement, public service announcement. Mm -hmm. uh, we will be doing the show on Monday next week. So the Tuesday show is on Monday. Tuesday huh? show is on Monday. Things happen. Um, 
So uh, we'll be doing it same time though, September 22nd at 4 o'clock. So mark your calendars and we'll send out the usual tweets and Facebook announcements and um, I don't know, do you announce this on Pinterest? Is that how that works? Afraid not, Martin. Oh, okay. No, well, maybe checking. I should. I didn't want to leave it out. Maybe this week I will. Who knows? Figure it out. Yeah. What? Watch uh, and see. So what are we talking about? We're talking about, we, we just mentioned uh, Evernote. We're talking about note-taking apps. Uh, note-taking note -taking apps on your computer, on your devices. We're talking about Evernote and OneNote and Google Keep and all kinds of things. It's kind of a back-to-school special as well because uh, note-taking software is... Uh, uh, very important for our students, but uh, also for uh, you and I, Sally. We take a lot of notes, and uh, I don't know about you. I'm a big OneNote fan, uh, but I'm sure there are lots of other options out there. So come back on Monday if you'd like to join us live, uh, which we would uh, always welcome anybody to do at 4 p.m. Central. Excellent. Um, we have a video to close out the show, Martin. You can find it on our show notes page and we'll have a link. But it is um, by a talented singer named David Wesley. It's a version of In Christ Alone. There's a lot of copies of it, a lot of videos of In Christ Alone um, performance out on YouTube. And this is one I found particularly excellent because, as you can see, if you're looking at my screen, he's doing David, his own backup, huh? Right. Recorded. <laughs> Uh, seven different versions of himself singing this song, all the different uh, sections of the song, and it's very well done, so you'll enjoy it. Cool. Love that song in Christ. Mm -hmm. uh, Wellstech.wells.net is the place to go for all of our show notes information to view the uh, or download the video, the audio. Uh, we are on um, iTunes. We're on Stitcher. Uh, you can get us uh, wherever your favorite podcasts are, uh, are shown. Um, also, if you'd like to contribute to the show, wellstech.wells.net is a good place to go. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. Um, so lots of opportunities to uh, connect with us and share uh, the knowledge that you have about how technology is working in your either professional or personal ministries. So, it's been a long time since we've had an hour-plus show, Martin. Yep. We're at an hour, hour and five plus. minutes, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we would welcome uh, those contributions. So, uh, if we want to uh, follow along with what Sally is doing through the course of the week, Sally, you have a Twitter handle, right? Where are you on on Twitter? I'm Sally Draper. Easy to find. Uh, just wanted to make sure that you for didn't forget about Twitter. Yeah, I'll be sure to tweet something, Martin. Thanks for the reminder. And I'm at M Spriggs. Uh, thank you for joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>